2 Samuel 23, we'll begin reading verse number 8. The Bible says, These be the names of the mighty men whom David had. The Tachmanite that sat in the seat, chief among the captains, the same was Adino the Esnite. He lift up his spear against 800 whom he slew at one time. I'm telling you, if one guy takes a spear and whips 800 men, slays them, that's, that's a dude right there. But if one guy slays 800 men with a, with a spear, that's a bad guy. That's a tough... Arnold Schwarzenegger don't even do that in any of his movies, huh? Look at verse number 9. And after him was Eleazar, the son of Dodo, the Ohite. Now listen, if you've got a dad named Dodo, you better know how to fight. <laughs> All right? Uh, one of the three mighty men with David when they defied the Philistines that were, to gather, were there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. He rose and smote the Philistines uh, until his hand was weary and his hand clave unto the sword, and the Lord wrought a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to spoil. And after him was Shema, the son of Ag, the Herite, and the Philistines were gathered together into a troop where, uh, where was a piece of ground full of lentils. And the people fled from the Philistines. And he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it and slew the Philistines. And the Lord wrought a great victory. Do you notice a theme here? All three of these guys are in a battle against Philistines, but the people flee. If you're waiting on people to gather with you to help you when you're up against it, friend, you're going to be sadly mistaken. If you're waiting for the Republicans or the Democrats to deliver you, you're in trouble. If you're waiting for the community to rally and stand up, you're in trouble. Hmm? Let's read on. I'm not preaching on that, but let's read on. Verse number 13. And three of the thirty, and this is one of my favorite stories in all the Old Testament. And three of the thirty chief went down and came to David in the harvest time unto the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines pitched in the valley of Rephium. And David was then in an hold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. And David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me a drink of the water of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. And the three mighty men break through the host of the Philistines and drew out water by the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. Nevertheless, he would not drink thereof, but poured it out unto the Lord. And he said, Be it far from me, O Lord, that I should do this. Is not this the blood of the men that went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. These things did these three mighty men. They heard David say, boy, I'd like to have a drink of water out of the well down in Bethlehem. And they fought through Philistines all night to get there, got the water, fought through Philistines all night to get back to where David was and brought him to water. I mean, these are some tough hombres. Let's pray. Father, we bless your holy name. Lord, we thoroughly enjoyed all the great testimonies. Not one time did anybody bring attention to themselves. They all bragged on you and your goodness and how you've answered prayer and how you've blessed and how you've touched their lives and how you've impacted them, how you've opened their eyes to truth and uh, opened uh, their eyes to your goodness. God, we're thankful for that. Thank you for the good singing. We're glad you touched us. And Lord, blessed be your name regardless of what lot befalls us. Lord, we're thankful for the word of God. Now help us tonight edify your people. Lord, uh, just from some of the testimonies, it's... Uh, uh, clear to see that the devil fights folks and that folks face opposition, they face obstacles, they face hardships. Lord, they go through things. And Lord, tonight they're in the house of God. And I pray that, Lord, you'd bless them abundantly. Lord, you'd increase their faith. You'd strengthen them in the inner man. And God, we certainly pray in a crowd this size for somebody unsaved that tonight would be the night of their salvation. Use this unworthy vessel. And God glorify your name. We'll thank you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here we find David's mighty men. I got to think about mighty men. Can I say, first of all, these mighty men were tested. 
One doesn't cut, become mighty without fighting. Hmm? What good would it be to have a million man army if they really weren't tested? I don't know, some of you are too young to remember, but when Desert Storm came about, all you heard was about the Royal Guard of the Afghanistan Army and how great they were. And they had a million men and how wonderful they'd been. And really, we hadn't tested our army in a long time. And General Schwarzkopf went through those guys like they were cardboard cutouts. Hmm? If you're going to be mighty, you've got to be tested. You've got to, you've got to fight. Can I say there's not many mighty Christians today because there's not many who are doing any fighting. We find in Laodicea chapter, the Laodicean church in Revelation chapter 3 that they'd gotten comfortable. They were increased with goods, felt like they had need of nothing, and yet they did not know they were poor, wretched, blind, miserable, naked. And that's what a lot of Christians are. But think, boy, we go to church, we do this, we do this, but we really haven't tested our faith. Faith that's not tested really is worthless. Hmm? And can I say mighty men are tested and I say something else about mighty men they're true they're loyal these men were known as David's mighty men they weren't known as just mighty men they were David's mighty men can I say these were part of that troop when David fled from Saul and they started out with a band of just about 600 hiding out in dens and caves. These were some of the off of the world. Nobody else cared about these fellows, uh, but David did, and David loved them, and David uh, made them one of his, uh, and they were loyal to the end so much that they were willing to put their lives in jeopardy to go get him a drink of water. That's loyalty. Can I say these men were tested? They were true. Give me some Christians that are true. Hmm? Give me Christians that live up to their name that are truly Christ-like. Some that are loyal to Christ regardless, uh, regardless of what the world thinks, uh, regardless of what hell thinks, uh, regardless of what their neighbors think, their co-workers think, uh, even some of their family thinks. Uh, give us some folks that are loyal, that are true, because Jesus is faithful and true. Mighty men are tested. They're true. Can I say about this about them? They're tenacious. Hmm? They're not cold-weathered fans. They're very tenacious. Uh, it doesn't matter what situation they find themselves, they're going to be mighty men. By the way, they didn't call themselves mighty men. They just proved they were mighty men. Hmm? You say, preacher, how were they tenacious? I'm glad you asked. Notice that one in verse number eight uses a spear. Adino, the Esnite, lift up his spear. That's what he had. He was tenacious with it. Slew 800 men. Notice that one used a sword. In verse number 10, Eleazar. He rose, smote the Philistines until his hand was weary, uh, and his hand claved unto the sword, and the Lord won a great victory that day. Uh, uh, what happened? He just slew Philistines until he couldn't slay them anymore. The Lord come by and grabbed his hand and kept us slaying them. Are you listening? One used a sword. One used a spear. Just tenacious. Use what they had. Can I say one just stood? Hmm? Look at verse number 12. Uh, speaking of Shema, it said, And he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it. Mm -mm. You've heard me say this many times, a man that won't stand for something will fall for anything. Ephesians 6 says, Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Can I say, sometimes the Lord don't want you to pick up a spear. Sometimes the only sword He wants you to pick up is the Word of God. Uh, but He always wants you to stand. Uh, he wants you to stand in the gap and make up the hedge. Uh, he wants you to stand and take every blow the enemy can throw at you. Uh, every punch the enemy can throw at you. Uh, every dart that the enemy can shoot at you. He said, just stand. Uh, take the shield of faith uh, and just stand. Uh, and my dear friends, you'll make a great impact. Uh, but can I say? One used a spear, one used a sword, one just stood, but then all three of them supplied the water. Mm -mm. They were tenacious. I don't know about you, but I like watching sports and I like watching athletes that are tenacious. 
I'm going to mention a guy that played for the Bengals back in the 70s that most of you never heard of. He mainly was a backup running back, like a third stringer, but he played on special teams, and he was always the first one down on the kickoffs, and he would absolutely fly through the air and wreck his body to hit somebody. His name was Tough Tony Davis. He was tenacious. Wasn't gifted physically, just tenacious. Hmm? Some of you older guys remember a guy by the name of uh, Ray Nitschke, tenacious linebacker for the Green Bay Packers. Some of you will recognize this name, Bill Berge. Played for the Bengals, went on to play for Philadelphia Eagles. Tenacious middle linebacker. Have you ever heard of a fellow by the name of Dick Buckus? Dick Buckus didn't believe in sacking the quarterback. He believed in ripping his head off. Hmm? Christian was a middle linebacker, so I know all about middle linebackers. He used to have a wall of all these pictures. I got him all these linebackers. I had one picture of uh, Buckus where... Uh, Four guys was blocking him, and he still made the sack. He was tenacious, ferocious. What they have today, they call the NFL, we call sissy ball. They're not even like, they arm tackle nowadays. They don't even hit nobody anymore. Uh, if they do, they're, you know, throwing a flag for targeting. Well, that's, yeah, he's got the ball. He's the target. Hit him. That's what it used to be, huh? Cindy, you've been on the sidelines. You, I've heard you scream in the stands and all that. They're supposed to hit them. Yeah. It's not two-hand touch. But I like folks who are tenacious. They're a loose ball on a basketball court. Somebody diving after them. That's a tenacious fella. Somebody who'll go get it. What can I say? These men were tenacious in their service to the king. I love Christians who are tenacious. It doesn't matter what they're going through, they're going to come and worship, and you don't even know they're going through something because they're tenacious. Because Jesus has done so much for them, they're going to do something for Jesus or die. Mm -mm. Uh, I want to draw your attention to verse number 11. This is where I'm really interested. Look at verse 11 said, And after him was Shema, the son of Ag, the Herite. And the Philistines were gathered together into a troop. And here's what I'm interested. Where was a piece of ground? I'm interested in that, a piece of ground tonight. Now, Brother Jim was in the military. Brother Charlie was in the military. But neither really went to combat like in Vietnam or World War II. I've read a lot after those men that fought in those combat situations, and a lot of times they were charged with just standing and defending a piece of ground. Take a hill. That was it. Not win the war. Just take a hill. Defend this ground. Do not let it be taken. My father-in-law was highly decorated from Vietnam. For years, we did not understand why he didn't like the holidays. He was usually down on Thanksgiving. Who could be down on Thanksgiving? We're going to eat till we can't, can't eat no more. We're going to unbuckle our britches and eat some more. But he, he doesn't like the holidays. It wasn't until just a few years ago we found out why. On Thanksgiving Day, he was commanded to take his troops and defend a hill. They did for three days. It was all said and done. He lost his whole command except him and two other guys come off that hill. They saved the hill. He came off of it wounded. A lot of the men he served with, they didn't make it off the hill. They defended their hill. Here we find that Shema defends a piece of ground. And I say the piece of ground in the context of our lives is where God has placed you. God has given you a piece of ground in your Christian life. Can I say this? It's a place where God has a purpose for you. It may be on your job. It may be in your neighborhood. It may be working through this local church. But God has a place for you, and He has a purpose for you. 
And the piece of ground may be where he wants to produce something in you. My dear friends, make no doubt, God has planted you to bloom for his glory. And I want to preach with just a few minutes with God's help out of verse number 12 where it says, But he stood in the midst of the ground. I want to preach on standing your ground. Standing your ground. There's been too much loss for the Christian faith, yet the Bible tells us that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church of the living God. So therefore, if something's lost, it's because we surrendered it. It's because we didn't stand our ground. Because we allowed the enemy to come in and sow tares among the wheat and take it from us. Mm, can I say, the reason there's no longer prayer in public schools is because Christians didn't do anything about it. Do you realize that Benjamin Franklin, when he talked about the school system, said that uh, uh, the Bible needed to be taught in the school system? At least uh, 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 the Ten Commandments ought to be taught in our school system. The reason it's not today is because Christians decided it wasn't that important. Hmm? The reason, even though in Washington, D.C., uh, in the, uh, uh, where Congress meets, uh, where the Senate gets together, uh, and where they make laws framing this nation, uh, 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 can I say uh, uh, the Rotunda has all kinds of people that, who have been given to the law through the generations. Uh, it shows their profile. The only one that shows the full face uh, is a, uh, a rendition of Moses. Uh, and the reason our uh, uh, Senate and our uh, Congress uh, and our president president uh, could care less about the Bible, what Moses had to say in the law, uh, what Christ had to say, uh, what Paul wrote to the epistles uh, for churches, uh, uh, the reason they're not interested, the reason uh, they say we're not essential uh, is because we're not essential. They feared our vote. They would certainly listen to what we had to say. Because we haven't stood our ground. We have fallen into as long as I can go where I want to go, do what I want to do, am not bothered by anybody, have enough to eat and enough to get by with, uh, and as long as I can go to church, everything's okay. And all the while, people are dying and going to hell because we haven't stood our ground. I'm going to preach on standing your ground. Can I say, first of all, the ground may be obscure. May not mean much to many people. Look again at verse number 11. It says, uh, After him was Shema, the son of Aji, the Herorite, the Philistines were gathered together into a troop uh, where was a piece of ground full of lentils. Here it is. And the people fled from the Philistines. This is an obscure piece of ground. The people fled it. They didn't care about it. They said, let the Philistines have it. Uh, doesn't mean much to them. Uh, and can I say, uh, your piece of ground might not mean much to the world. Uh, might not mean much to anybody else. Uh, but it's where God's planted you. Uh, it's where God has a purpose for you. Uh, it's where God wants to produce something out of you. Uh, hey, uh, it is important to God. Uh, and it's important to you. Uh, it may be obscure. Nobody else may know anything about what you're going through. Uh, nobody else may know anything about your piece of ground and what it means. Uh, but friend, uh, uh, look under heaven uh, and make up your mind. Uh, get a backbone like a saw log uh, and say this is where God placed me uh, and stand your ground regardless of how obscure it may be. It doesn't matter if anybody else cares about it or not. It's where God puts you. Stand your ground. It may be obscure. But can I say something about your ground? It has opportunities. Look again at verse number 11. Get a hold of this. It says that the Philistines were gathered together into troops. Where was a piece of ground? Look right here. Full of lentils. Say, so what's a lentil? That's a bunch of peas. This was Seamus' pea patch. And he wouldn't let the Philistines have it. It had plenty of opportunities. This was how Shema might have been willing to feed his family. 
Maybe he's going to use these peas to be a blessing to the other mighty men. Uh, maybe he was going to offer them uh, as a fruit offering to the Lord. I don't know. Uh, but he said, hey, this pea patch may not mean anything to anybody else, uh, but these Philistines are not getting this pea patch. Uh, there were opportunities uh, with this piece of ground. Uh, and friends, uh, others might not see the fruit that can come for your ground. Uh, others may not see uh, why this ground is important to you. Uh, can I say the world could care less whether or not the King James Bible is the Word of God and you're standing on it. Uh, the world could care less about your Baptist distinctives. Uh, uh, the world could care less about your standards. Uh, the world could care less about why you do what you do. Uh, but it's important to you. Uh, it's important to God. Uh, and you ought to stand your ground because there's opportunities that can come from it. Uh, can I say... When you was lost, you didn't care about the King James Bible either until you got born again and found out it's the Word of God. Hmm? Uh, you need to stand your ground. Why? It may be obscure. Stand it. But it does have possibilities. Uh, can I say this about your piece of ground? It has opposition. Oh, yeah, them Philistines gathered together in a troop. They wanted them peas. They looked off and said, boy, look at all them peas over there. That's, uh, that looks a lot better than what we've been eating. Let's go get them. Those lentils are right in order. Hmm? Can I say the devil knows the fruit of your ground? The devil wants what you have. Hmm? Can I say the opposition is after your faith? Done told you, he's going to fight you the next couple of weeks. He's wanting you to doubt God, because if you, he can get you to doubt God, he wins. Because without faith, it's impossible to please God. He's after your faith. Can I say this? He's after the flock. Mm. He is. Now, he knows when we're banded together, he has a tougher time of it, so he tries to isolate it, one of us every now and then. Huh? That message we heard Sunday night on the traps, he's got traps set. He's after the flock. Can I say this? Uh, he's after the fruit. He wants the lentils. Uh, can I say this? He wants those that are in the balance of getting saved. He don't want them to get saved. Uh, can I say he got mad tonight, all these kids bragging on the Lord. Boy, he don't like that. Uh, he hates it. He wants to steal that. He wants the kids to just, to, you know, just be obscure in the service, never say anything, just come to church, go home. He don't want them taking part. He's afraid one of them might get plugged in. He's afraid one of them may, one of these days, surrender to preach. Maybe the next Billy Sunday sitting in here tonight. Who knows? But there'll be opposition to your ground. That's why you got to stand your ground. Hmm? Huh? If the devil wants it so bad, it's worth fighting for. Hmm? Can I say this? When it comes to standing your ground, this will help some of you. The ground just needs one. You got Shema and the troop of the Philistines. Hmm. Earlier, you had Eleazar. Huh? You had a Dino, just one. In this piece of ground, there's just one Shema. That's it. I mean, David didn't come to help him. Adino and Eleazar wasn't there. The other mighty men weren't there. It was just him. Hmm? You don't need the whole church to help you. If you haven't figured this out, maybe this will help you. The Lord and you is the majority. Hmm? Again, if he be for us, who can be against us? Hmm? Just needs one. Notice Shema, verse 12. He stood. Stand your ground. Hmm? Again, having done all to stand, stand therefore. Did not God tell Moses, stand still and see the salvation of the Lord? Quit bouncing all around, just stand still. He stood. But notice this, he stayed. He said, but he stood in the midst of the ground and defended it. He stayed. He didn't run. He didn't find something better to do. He stood 
and he stayed, and then he slew. Look what it says. Stood in the midst of the ground, defended it, and slew the Philistines. Hmm? That's what he did. You say, how, do, how are we supposed to slay Philistines, preacher? Well, Philistines are always a picture of the world. How do you slay them? You use truth. You want to make a heathen mad? Just quote the Bible. And no matter what argument they throw, just give them Scripture. You'll make a matter in a wet hen. Hmm? They want to draw you into a logical fight. Well, we have no logic to stand on, but we do have the truth to stand on. And you know what? They can't, they can't argue with truth. They, they may not like it, and they may say all kinds of things about it, but truth is truth. Mm -mm. And sooner or later, they'll just think you're crazy because you believe this Bible and walk away, but you will defend your ground. You'll slay some Philistines with the truth. But notice what else happened with Shema. Yeah, he stood, he stayed, he slew, but God saw what he did. Look what it says in verse 12. And the Lord brought a great victory. The Lord looked down here and saw him standing and staying and slaying. The Lord says, you know what, I'm getting in on that. And the Lord's the one that brought the great victory. Hmm? Uh, say, how did he do it? Well, he's just God. He just did it. Uh, he gave Shema skills Shema didn't know he, that he had. Did not the Lord tell us not to take thought of what we would say in the day of opposition? Uh, that the Spirit of God would bring it to our remembrance? How many times if somebody asks you something or start talking to you, you start talking to them about the Lord, and all of a sudden you start quoting verses you didn't even know you'd ever read? That's called the Holy Ghost. He does that. He brings all things to our remembrance. Yeah, your ground may be obscure. It does have opportunities, and it does have opposition, but it just needs one. Just one. You need to make up your mind. If nobody else stands, you're going to stand. You'll be the one. Now, let me say this. It will have an outcome. The Lord great wrought a great victory that day. You're never going to win anything if you don't fight. You've got to stand. And sometimes that's all the fighting you have to do is just make a stand. But there will be an outcome. And any time we do anything for the Lord, our labor is not in vain. Even if you feel like a failure, Jeremiah did, God still gets glory, and friend, that's what it's all about. There's been many of people, including the Apostle Paul, that went to a martyr's death, and people say, look at that, that's a failure. Brought glory to God, and we still talk about them today. Hmm? Now, my question just simply is this. Will you stand your ground? Will you stand your ground for a revival? Will you go forth from this place tonight determined that you're going to pray for revival every day, you're going to pray for the preachers every day, you're going to pray for God to walk through this place every day, you're going to pray for the saints of God to be set on fire, you're going to pray for sinners to get saved as a result, are you going to pray for revival? Are you going to stand for revival? Here's what happens, Brother Don. We all get so busy in our life, we expect a preacher to pray for revival. Will you pray for revival? Are you going to stand your ground? Are you going to stand if nobody else does? Make up your mind, you're going to pray for revival. Young people, you bless my heart real good tonight with all your testimony. Will you just make a stand? Will you pray for revival every day? I believe God will hear your prayers. You're going to stand your ground for a revival? You're going to stand your ground for the remnant? Thank God they still got 7,000 hadn't bowed their knee to Baal. Are you listening? You know, 
congregations all across this country feel like they're not what they used to be. They think they're not doing much. But if we could see what God sees, God's got people all over this country serving God, sold out, living for God, seeking God. If we'd all just stand our ground and pray on behalf of the church as a whole and on behalf of local assemblies, no tell them what God would do. Hmm? Will you stand your ground for the remnant? Will you pray for your church family? You pray God helps them and blesses them and undergirds them and strengthens them? Will you pray for these kids? Can you imagine what peer pressure they're facing? You, you stand up testifying, you go to the job next day, you get cussed out, and you get all defeated. Can you imagine what they're going to face tomorrow at school? Especially them Schneckenbergers, they got a terrible teacher. You know, every time they make a stand, the devil does everything he can to discourage them. You going to pray for these kids? If we don't have revival next week, what kind of church are they going to have six months from now? You know, used to, we'd say, what kind of church are you going to have in 20 years? I don't know if we got 20 years. How about let's just look ahead six months? Look at the last two years. There's churches that still have not recovered. Are you going to stand your ground for revival? For the remnant? Are you going to stand your ground for our rights? How much are we going to let them take away? Preacher, what can I do? Well, you, first of all, you can vote. Second of all, you can pray for our politicians where we're commanded to. But third of all, you can write them, you can call them, you can tell them, we, we are essential. We're not standing for this. You going to do something? Boom. I'm, 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 not, I'm not falling for all that. We're going to live for God. First Amendment of the Constitution is still there. You don't have to read the whole Constitution, Congressman. Just read the First Amendment. That's all you need to know. Vote that way or we'll vote you out. The preacher shouldn't bring politics in the pulpit. Why not? I remember when politicians used to come to the church and want the church's vote. It's about time they see there is still a mighty army called Christians in this country. But it doesn't do any good if you don't stand your ground. Because hmm? what's the next mandate? That's all I'm going to say about it. A mandate's not a law. They've got to pass it through Congress to be a law. Just because they mandate it don't mean anything. They can huff and they can puff, but they can't blow this house down. But you know why they get away with it? Because everybody cowers. Nobody will stand their ground. Don't you stand your ground. So I wonder tonight, you going to stand your ground for Christ? You're going to stand your ground for revival? For the people of God? How about our elderly? They've done their standing. But they can't do it anymore. You going to stand for him? Hmm? Listen, Paul said he was a debtor. You're a debtor for the faith. Somebody once stood in the gap, made up the head so you could hear the gospel. You're a debtor. What are you going to do with it? Where much is given, much is required. You going to make a stand? Said, Preacher, what, what little ground I got isn't much. It is to God because he gave it to you. And he has a purpose for it. You're going to stand your ground for the remnant? You're going to stand your ground for your rights? Or are you going to be a byproduct to everything else that's going on? Christians in name only. I'm not seeking a title of a mighty man. I just want to stand up and be counted. They used to say things like this. Speak the truth and let the chips fall where they may. We're afraid 
to where the chips may fall. Might upset our little apple carts. I don't think Shema was too worried about apple carts. He just stood his ground. How about it tonight? You going to stand? See, Shema made up his mind long before the Philistine gathered that he was going to stand. That way he didn't have to make that decision in the heat of the battle. A lot of you don't make up your mind ahead of time. And then when the tr trouble comes, you don't know which way to turn. You need to make up your mind right now. Come what may. I'm going to stand for Christ. And then when the time comes, you'll stand. Will you stand your ground? Let's all stand tonight. Some are already coming. Brother Clint, come get a song of invitation. God spoke to your heart. Come. Maybe you're here tonight and you're not saved. No, what a salvation message. We'd love to take the scripture to show you how to be saved. Maybe you're here tonight. You're saved. God spoke to your heart. You just mind the Lord. Maybe you haven't even prayed for a revival yet. Now would be a good time to get caught up. Will you stand your ground? Some are coming. They're picking out a song. Let's pray. Father, we love you. Thank you for that chapter. There's so much that could be brought out from them fellows. And even the ones we didn't read after. Lord, I'm thankful for folks that have paid the price. That have stood. Lord, I'm thankful for men of God that have stood and proclaimed the truth. God, I'm thankful for people of God that have prayed and they've stood their ground. And I'm thankful for folks that when opposition come, they just run to you and made a stand. Lord, we're thankful for that. Help us in this generation to be known as a generation that stood as well. Now, Father, bless these young people. Help them, undergird them. God, give them uh, not only your choice blessings, but Lord, give them hope and faith. God, bless them abundantly. God, I pray for your people now. You'd revive them. Do great things through them. God, help them, Lord, to set aright the things that are off course in this world. And God, use them to bring great revival in these days. Father, bless now this invitation. Help these in the altar. God, if there's somebody here tonight unsaved, I pray tonight be the night of their salvation. Bless now, for it's in Jesus' name we do pray. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.